the foundation of the universe had been revealed orally to the descendants of Abraham. Those descendants that found the oral tradition grew wise in a new land to the West. Raised and nurtured in the liberty of the Greek democracy, the oral tradition flourished and was embraced by the descendants of the divine, the ten, and those who had the spark of light still within them. With a new generation accepting the truth of the nature of man, the truth of the nature of God, that these two were one, the divine feminine and her daughters, still imprisoned within the underworld, gain back some of their real energy, deep within the confines of the world of the dead. These worshipers in Greece breathed new life into them. Those in Greece who again spoke of the ten and the world before the fall when God and man were one gave hope to purity and her daughters. Those worshipers even gave her a new name, a name that she would one day be known in the new age. The Greeks called her Sophia, for she was the incarnation of wisdom. Purity, now called Sophia, was mostly pleased with what her descendants in the land of Greece were doing. Through the power of worship, the men in Greece had, however, set another above her in the land of the dead. The new god was named Hades, and he lacked the character or the wisdom to rule well in the underworld. Hades grew despotic as his worshippers, dark ones, worshipped him and erected his temples. Over a period of hundreds of years, as the empire in Greece grew and flourished, and with the dead dying in the wars fought to expand that empire, Hades became a very powerful god. Sophia's worshippers were the elite in intellect and character, and she drew solace with that despite the fact that her worshippers had been eclipsed by those who worshipped Hades. Danu, however, grew despondent. She was tired of waiting, waiting in this land of the dead for her opportunity. She grew restless, and with that restlessness, she was determined to take any opportunity that pre presented itself to go back back to the world where she could enact her revenge on Enlil. Danu became more and more distant from her mother and sister. She believed that her mother and sister had grown too at ease in a world that was not their own. Danu, knowing that Hades despised his brothers, those who ruled the heavens and the sea respectively, hatched a plan of her own. She asked for an audience with the king of the underworld and was granted one. She proposed a plan to Hades, appealing to his ego. She would convince him that only she could help him defeat his brothers. Make me one of the gods, she told him, and I will breed discontentment and sow chaos among them. My dear lady, said Hades, contemptuously looking down from his throne at her. You are nothing to the gods of the Greeks. They have no reason to fear you. Indeed, Danu responded, and that will be their downfall. For it is one thing I have grown to understand in these many, many years. It is how to be crafty as a serpent and wily as a fox. I know I can breed discord within the ranks of the gods. I can cause them to destroy each other and fall from their lofty peak on Mount Olympus. Hades was intrigued by the idea. 
You have nothing to lose and everything to gain, my lord, Danu concluded. She could see that the idea had taken root in his mind. And why, pray tell, is this so important to you, my dear lady? Hades inquired. I have an interest in revenge, Danu stated darkly. One that will eventually take me far from the islands of the Greeks. Then so be it! Hades declared in his booming voice, echoing in the royal chamber of hell. I will get my worshippers to invoke you. Through their worship, you will once again gain power. They will know you as the goddess of chaos. Your name will be Discordia, also known as Eris. Eris, Danu answered. That is the name I will be known by from this day forward. Having to go through the process of messaging his worshippers, using a channel that was only available to him, Hades told Danu, Eris, to be patient a bit longer. It would take great effort to invoke her back into the world of the living, and she would have to be patient a bit longer for revenge. Sophia got wind of Danu's plans and approached her. What is this I hear about you going back to the land of the living? Sophia asked her daughter. That this scoundrel Hades has made you an offer, one that would get you involved in the affairs of the gods of the Greeks, affairs that have nothing to do with us. I am the one who presented him with the offer, mother, Danu answered with a bit too much pride in her voice. I will go again into the world as a worshipped goddess, and in my time enact my revenge on he who trapped us here. Foolish child, Sophia scolded her. Hades is using you, and at what cost to you that you embrace chaos, a power unwieldy, and far from the light. No, mother, Danu said, now angry. You do not know me any more. I was born to this. This is who I am. Your thirst for revenge is clouding your judgment, my dearest Danu. It is making you make rash decisions. The decision is mine to make, mother, Danu responded forcefully bringing the conversation to an end. And my name is now Eris. I embrace who I am and turn my back on who I once was. Your words hurt me very deeply, my daughter, was Sophia's heartbroken response, words unheard by Eris as she had turned away and had left. Sophia went to implore Hades not to allow it, Hades told her that he had already contacted his people on the world, a process that only he knew how to do. As Sophia addressed Hades in his court, her headstrong child Danu, now known as Eris, had arrived for the invocation. I am begging you, Danu, Sophia implored. Do not do this. We can find another way. Enlil will be defeated in time. You must be patient. It is too early and you are too weak. You do not know me as well as you think you do, mother. I am no longer a child. I know what I am doing. I forbid it, Fia exclaimed in anguish. At this, Hades laughed. It is too late. The invocation has already begun. And indeed, Hades was right. Eris had begun to vanish before their eyes. Do not worry, my mother. Briefly, the voice of Purity's beloved child had resurfaced in this new incarnation, now called Eris. 
everything will be fine and we will again rule as a result of this choice I have made. Sophia, seeing her child vanish before her eyes, wept bitter tears. Now she had only May to keep her company in the land of the dead. Hades, always the insensitive boar, couldn't resist rubbing salt in the fresh wound. You cannot forbid someone like Eris from doing what she wants. Surely you are not foolish enough to believe that your words would cause anything but contempt in her. Sophia only looked up briefly at Hades, but in that look all the anguish and sickness in her heart was reflected in something new, a reason to renew her strength she found in the vril. One day, she vowed to herself, Hades would falter, and she would rule this land of the dead. Eris was pleased by her newfound power and immediately used it. Chaos, however, is never embraced by those who refuse to understand it, and Eris soon found out that she was an outcast of the gods. Unwanted, she did as she told Hades she would. She bred discontentment among the gods and men. Through her direct action, a war with Troy would be fought. Era soon learned to rely on just herself, as she was cut off from the power source, the Vril, that she had once known. Chaos, a power more powerful but difficult and unwieldy became her source. After years among the living, as the power of the Greeks' gods waned and was overcome by the land they call Italy, Eris never faltered in her mission, revenge. She found the descendants of Abraham in a land that now bore the name of Israel. As the Greek Empire became absorbed by the Roman, the Greek God's power waned. It was an advent of a new age, and a new savior was being championed. Eris did not know whether the new religion that had taken roots in Abraham would mean the destruction of her power. She feared that if she didn't act against Enlil soon, all would be lost. Eris decided to confront Enlil in his own land. She was emboldened by the talk of a new religion, one based on the idea that the kingdom of God was within all men. She had heard talk about the one they had called Emmanuel, God is with us, and thought that surely Enlil and his tyrannical rule was drawing to a close. Eris, in Enlil's land, the place they now called Israel, confronted her old enemy. This time, she was sure she could defeat him once and for all. Enlil, getting called out by Eris directly in the desert, moved out to meet her. Danu, Enlil greeted his old nemesis playfully. Again you come to me. You must like being defeated. This time... I will show you no mercy. I am much more powerful now than I once was. My power lies in who I am now, as Eris. I sense that, Enlil conceded. But chaos is a cumbersome weapon, one that is not easy to wield. I did not come here for conversation. Girder your loins, Enlil. You will soon taste my wrath. The fight in the desert was apocalyptic and went on for many years. Often Eris had the upper hand and Enlil believed he lost many times. As the generations of men lived and died, the battle went on. Enlil's power increased, however, 
as his archons went out to deceive the world and create new followers. The message of the anointed one had become corrupted, as Enlil had done so many times in the past. He was able to bring new worshippers to his fold, and with it new and stronger power. As the power of liberty began to wane, and a new empire grew in strength on the earth, Enlil's archons had managed to fool many of the descendants of men to worship him. It appeared that Sophia's warning that it was too soon for her children to regain their position among men was correct. After years and years of battle, Eris, drawing upon the power of chaos, began to falter. Enlil was delighted to see, again, his old enemy weaken before him. Give it up, child, Enlil mocked as one of his balls of fire knocked Eris to the ground. You are defeated. You cannot destroy me, Eris said, struggling to her feet as Enlo approached to deliver the final blow. I am a force of nature. Chaos cannot be destroyed. Enlo, laughing triumphantly, said, I know this, but you underestimate my ability. And now you will know that order, my order, will always be triumphant. Enlil gestured, and with it they were surrounded by his archons. I only fought you this long so that my people could again corrupt the message delivered by the one they call the Anointed One. Now that my archons have once again established me as the one true god of this world, I have the power to do this. A moan came out of the mouths of the Archons, a low, guttural sound that shook the heavens above the dark, starless desert night. Something darker than the night itself opened, a door to another dimension. I think you know what this door is to, Enlil, triumphant. It is a lonely prison, my dear, this place called Tartius. The door, darker than the darkest night, sucked Eris into the air. This is my time now! Enlil screamed through the whirlwind that had engulfed her. My order will always triumph! was the last thing she heard before the blackness enclosed her. The portal closing shook both the heavens and the earth and could even be felt in the underworld. Sophia, immediately knowing what had happened, rushed to the palace of Hades. Unceremoniously, no one with the nerve to stop her, Sophia approached the once powerful seat of the god of hell. Get her back! Sophia demanded. I'm afraid that's not possible. Even if I still had the power, Hades said, genuinely sorry. Sophia turned away from Hades, distraught, and glared at the wall. The first time in her infinite life, confused, not knowing what to do. Hades, always tone deaf as to the cause of the distress of those around him, said in a conciliatory manner. She was headstrong. She was always going to do what she wanted. You mustn't blame yourself. Sophia turned with all the rage of a mother who had lost everything, her home, her children, and now even her beloved Danu. I don't blame myself. She said, all the more menacing, because it was only a whisper. I blame you. Rome, a place of great power and authority, a place where men and gods ruled supreme, a powerhouse on earth. No one dared to question the mighty rulers of Rome. Enlil and his archons saw in the mighty ones of Rome, 
great potential for world domination. They went forth, planting their deception and evils in the hearts of the inhabitants of Rome. The world had darkened over the years, and El Elyon, saddened and angered by the affairs of man, devised a plan, a plan that would forever change the world. Men of great power have become prideful, ignorant, and foolish. He seeks domination of heaven and earth. They have become like their father, Enlil. The words spoken by the father of lies, etched in the hearts of the proud. I alone am God, and there is no other. I shall bring forth from my bosom the spirit of life and light. Anointed One, arise. You are because I am. In the image of El Elyon, I shall make you great among men. You shall be morning star, king, savior, teacher, and friend. Wherever you go, I am. Wherever your words travel, I am. Whoever embraces you or your words, I am. Your mother, purity, she is, therefore, I am. Teach the people the spirit of life and light is within them. Write upon their hearts, ye are gods and sons of heaven. Give them the covenant of promise. You are savior and light bearer because you shall teach people about their inner power. Give the, po give the people the power to break the shackles that bind, to break free from the tyrants. It is this purpose I shall send you into the world, and your name shall be called Emmanuel. And so the Anointed One went forth and was birthed by a woman named Mary in Bethlehem. Emmanuel grew in wisdom and knowledge throughout his years. He traveled and taught many the great wisdom taught by his father. He faced challenges and hardships by the powers that be. They sought out ways to end his life, to snuff out his light. With time and patience, the powers of Enlil had finally succeeded, or so they thought. With the passing of the great anointed sun, the world darkened and trembled. The words of Emmanuel had touched many, and they remembered the words, Be aware of the lawless one the one to come, and is even here now, the spirit of Antichrist.